so I, I, um, I decided to make, so I'm going to be speaking about spine trauma. Um, I mainly focus this on thoracolumbar trauma. So we're going to go through a case and, um, and talk a little bit about the workup of these patients, um, kind of the initial assessment, uh, <clears throat> how to uh, evaluate a patient's clinical exam in the emergency room and develop and formulate a plan. And then what we do typically during surgery, some of the things that surgeons think about uh, during a case, some of the things, some of the kind of important considerations of, the, of these this particular and unique subset of patients that present to us uh, very frequently um, in, in the career of a spine surgeon. So, um, you know, there's no, unfortunately in, in this country, there's no shortage of spine trauma. And as a surgeon, um, as a neurosurgeon, uh, regardless of whether or not you have a spine fellowship or uh, predominantly do spine surgery, you're going to be expected to know how to somewhat manage these patients. So let's go through a little bit. This is going to be primarily interactive. So um, I would like some participation from our very intelligent audience here. So um, I'm going to present a case. We'll go through things uh, very systematically and, um, and, then, and then go from there. But, but please, I would like um, the, uh, the our audience, our medical students to uh, go ahead and, and speak up and present. I can't, I can't quite see your names. So I'm going to just kind of hope that you guys just kind of talk. Okay. <laughs> if you have any questions at any point, just let me know. I'm more than happy to uh, answer them. And I really want you guys to understand this. So please, if there's any little thing you're not sure about, no matter how simple the question may be, I want you guys to ask me it because this is the time to really uh, learn these things. Cause it, it can be, it can be kind of tricky. So anyway, so the patient is a 32 year old man um, who was in a high school. And, and this is, by the way, this is a patient that I had during my, um, during my attending trip at the Cleveland Clinic. So this is a 32 year old man um, who presented with a high speed motor vehicle accident. He was, um, he was driving, he was intoxicated. He was ejected from the windshield. He hit a, uh, uh, a telephone post and he was ejected from the windshield. It was polytrauma. He was very lucky. He could have easily um, had severe life-threatening injuries um, but he fortunately was okay. Somebody saw him, called the ambulance. They picked him up. He was GCS 15 on arrival. We're going to talk a little bit about that. What, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? Um, and then he also had severe low back pain and difficulty moving his legs. Okay. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about, tell me a couple of things here. What are the, what are the important things? One, um, we, we have a young patient who, what does that mean? That generally means that they have a 32 year old probably doesn't have too many medical comorbidities, right? They might, but that's not usually common. Usually a 32 year old is pretty healthy, right? It's not, it's very different from let's say a 78 year old with uh, atrial fibrillation on Eliquis, uncontrolled diabetes, obesity, so on and so forth, right? Those patients are a little bit, happen to be statistically speaking, a little bit more medically unhealthy, but a 32 year old is generally pretty healthy. So probably has no medical issues. Uh, when this happened, other than the fact that they were intoxicated. Um, GCS 15. So what, what is GCS? And what, what, is, what is the implication of that? Can somebody tell me? Yeah, so I think the GCS is based on your level of uh, arousal, based on your, your um, eyes, a voice, and motor. So GCS 15 is intact. So he's like full level consciousness currently. Excellent, right? So very, very good. Very, very good. Okay, so GCS. So GCS stands for Glasgow Coma Scale, okay? Um, and this is one of the, when you are a medical student, when you're a resident, when you're evaluating a patient in the emergency room from the neurosurgical perspective, right? Because a lot of, th the trauma setting is a very, very high, uh, very uh, fast paced, very, uh, lots of things going on. Um, I don't know if you, if you all have rotated through um, a general surgery rotation or uh, emergency room rotation, but if you're at a level one or two trauma center and you see these patients, I mean, it's literally all hands on deck. You have tons of people in the trauma bay. People are getting in lines, putting in a Foley catheter, getting an exam, initial assessment, bringing the patient for pan CT. There's so many things going on, right? By the time the neurosurgery team is consulted, right? You want to distill down all that volume of information. You want to, this is all this information that you're hit with. You want to just distill it down to the most relevant things because there's certain things that you're going to basically are gonna to need to know and decide whether or not this patient needs to have um, any further steps, right? So GCS is one of the simplest, easiest, and one of the most powerful tools we have to communicate level of the mental, the mental state, right? Um, so the level of arousal. 
So it's, I, I'm sure you all, you all know this, but if you don't, let's go through it quickly. So there are three, uh, there are three general tools. It's, I remember it's MVE, okay? So it's M6, V5, uh, V5, E4, right? So 654 in that order, MVE. I'm, I almost think I get MVA, but MVE, right? Just a way to remember that. So this, so there's six points to the motor response, right? So f f let's go through that quickly. So you have to look at that, obeys commands, okay? That's the key, that the patient is clearly following commands. Following commands generally is showing two fingers, wiggling the toes, things like that, okay? It's not, um, uh, people will say, oh, the, they're trying to grab at the ET, if, if the patient's intubated and they're trying to grab at the ET tube, that's not following commands, right? It has to be reliable. Also, squeezing, uh, squeezing fingers is not really a good, that, that can be a reflex. Um, it's not really um, a good way to accurately assess following commands, okay? That's the key, is following commands. Usually it's showing two fingers, nodding yes or no, things like that, okay? It, assuming the patient, if, if the patient's nonverbal. If the patient's verbal, obviously the patient's speaking with you and you know, is able to say the name, um, uh, the date, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and then they have other points here. You can just read these basically purposeful movement to painful stimulus. This is localizing. So if you do obnoxious stimulus, which can be sternal rub, superorbital pressure, trapezius pinch, there are different types of noxious stimulus. Um, the patient will try to localize that. So that is, or tries to grab at the ET tube. That's localization. That's not following commands. Okay. Um, withdraws from pain. Um, that is basically, uh, this can be, this can be a little bit hard to assess sometimes withdrawal. It just basically you, if you, let's say you, you apply a noxious stimulus, they, they just kind of move away from it. That's, that's what it is. Okay. Now flexor and extensor posturing are very stereotyped characteristic movements that occur every time you do that response. Okay. The keyword is stereo, stereotypical. Okay. And what that is a flex, flexor movement is basically exactly that they, they flex, they, it's, in, it's an inward flexion of the hands and feet inwardly. Um, not usually the legs, the legs, usually there's not too much of movement. It's usually just the hands. It's inwardly like this extensor is total, and that's decerebrate posturing. That's when, you know, the um, extensor muscles are just totally um, activated and the, the patient extends out their arms. And then obviously one point would be no motor response. It's not zero, right? It's one. You get one for no motor response, no movement whatsoever. Here's the thing. In the acute trauma setting, it can be hard to get in a patient who's intubated and comatose. You may not know what their true motor response is, right? Because oftentimes the uh, intubated patient, they have to give paralytics, Okay. So if the patient's paralyzed due to, or pharmacologically paralyzed, they're gonna be one by definition, right? So, uh, and, and then that may have been done to protect the airway. So now you do not have an exam or reliable exam. You know what that patient's motor exam is. And you may see something on the imaging that the patient will get subsequently. And you may wonder, well, hmm, I see something weird. What's this patient's exam? Because we really rely on the exam to dictate our management as you will see in a few more slides. Um, but if you don't have an exam, it puts you in a hard spot, right? Okay. Verbal, so you often have to get the history. You have to know whether or not the patient was moving before they got paralyzed. Um, were they moving their legs? Sometimes you don't have that history. Verbal response is, um, is basically, you know, you get five points if the patient's oriented. So that means, you know, they know their name, they know where they are, they know the year, so on and so forth, right? Four is like confused. And then you can see kind of the, the other points. The, generally, in, in my, from what I've seen, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen somebody who's like a three uh, or, or like a two. Uh, That's not usually, it's, it's usually they're either five or, or um, four or one. That's, that's, that's typical. Okay. Um, if they're confused, but can like, if they're disoriented, that's a four, right. But they're able to like say a couple of things here and there. One is normal rotor science. Now, um, if they're intubated, okay. If they're intubated, what, what happens then? Can someone tell me? What, what do you get for your ver verbal score? Get a one T, right? You got it. That's it. That, you have to put that T. That's the key. It's, it's a modifier that you have to add. So the patient can't give you a verbal response because they're intubated, right? So I've seen people call me, and sometimes people forget that. So they call me, oh, the patient's GCS2. <laughs> How, how's that possible? Oh, well, he's intubated. I'm like, well, then he should be a 3T, right? He's not technically a 2. All right. So, uh, and then with eye opening, it's the same thing. Four is eyes open spontaneously, 
And then um, there are other points for the different types of um, noxious stimulants or what you have to do in order to open their eyes, okay? Um, so then the scale is from uh, three to 15, right? 13 to 15 is minor brain injury. You can see right on the bottom, moderate brain injury is nine to 12 and severe is three to eight, okay? And what this does, it kind of dictates whether or not this patient may or may not have increased intracranial pressure. And if they do, and you see an abnormal head CT, then this patient may need intracranial Intra, uh, intracranial uh, uh, pressure monitoring, okay? So that, that's really how we use GCS. GCS is very, very helpful, all right? So in the case of this patient, he was GCS 15, right? Which is, which is great. That means he's awake, he's alert. Um, he's, you know, he gets all the points on all the different um, assessments, right? MVE, right? So, but the thing is, that doesn't tell us whether or not this patient has spot cord injury, right? I mean, the patient can be, the patient can be paraplegic, but still has GCS 15, right? So just want to kind of, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, there's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't take it that into account, right? Okay, so the patient, what are the basics in the emergency room? So this is, have you heard spinal precautions? What does that mean? So when a patient comes in, okay, with suspected spinal, spinal injury, right? The most, the key thing is to protect, obviously, the whole spine, but in particular, the cervical spine, right? So you can see on this, this is a flat board. This is a, this is a rigid, I forget what's amazing. Like some sort of really, really rigid plastic. And this, um, the, the head goes in here and, and is secured between these two pillows until they can put the patient in a um, rigid collar, which you see on the right side. This is called a Philadelphia collar. Um, this is really all the patient needs in the acute setting for the most part, um, assuming they don't have some horrible injuries such as atlanto-occipital dislocation, which is very rare, but it can happen. Um, uh, this, is, this kind of will just temporize the patient in the immediate short term uh, before they, if they end up meeting it, uh, will need surgery. So let's talk a little bit more about the spinal assessment of this patient. So he comes in. So we have this 32 year old guy who's intoxicated. He was in a high speed motor vehicle accident. He was ejected, right? He's GCS 15. He's awake. He's alert. He's verbal. So most likely there's no intracranial injury that's significant and or severe, right? Okay. Most likely. Um, he is has weakness in his lower extremities. So what does that mean? All right, well, he's uh, a five out of five throughout, okay? Um, and is in his lower extremity strength, he's five out of five at his hip flexion, five out of five at his knee extension. So approximately he's full strength, distally, DF, PF, EHL, dorsal flexion, plantar flexion, EHL, he's two out of five. All right, well, we're gonna talk about the motor scale, but what does that mean? What is a, what's a two out of five? Um, I think that's um, no movement with gravity, but you can move in the horizontal plane if the um, gravity is eliminated. Excellent. So, so no anti-gravity, right? The, there, is, there is movement, but it's not anti-gravity, right? So what does that mean? So if, you have, if you're anti-gravity, right, you can, lift up your, you can lift up your arm like this, right? Okay. But if you're not anti-gravity, you can move it, but you can't get it off the plane of the bed, right? Okay, very good. So in that case, the patient's able to kind of move, wiggle their toes or move their hand a little bit, or I'm sorry, move their foot a bit, but they cannot dorsiflex their foot, meaning like the foot is there, they cannot literally move this foot up against gravity, all right? So that, that's kind of the key distinction, and that's what really is very important to us as neurosurgeons is um, movement anti-gravity. So that, that distinction between two and three right, on that scale, which we'll go through in a little bit, is huge. That's, that's enormous. We don't really care so much about three, four, and five, right? These are just different degrees of strength. And in the acute trauma setting, um, it's not really helpful, right? It may not be accurate, right? What, what, how you know, a five and a four? I mean, the patient's in pain, they're scared, you know, they don't, they don't really know, right? But there is a big difference between a two and a three, right? So that's huge. Um, now, the patient also is complaining of decreased sensation below the umbilicus. Um, they also have poor rectal tone with no bulbal cavernosis reflex. What does that mean? Um, What's the significance of that? The bulbal, the last one you're saying? Yeah. Tell me about a uh, bulbal cavernosis reflex. What is that? Um, I think isn't that like, if you squeeze the, the gland, the penis, you get a rectal response. And uh, yep. if, if there's no, that means it's like they're in like spinal shock, I think. Very good. You got it. Very good. I'm, I'm impressed. All right. So, um, okay. So this was always a little bit confusing to me as a medical student, but let me explain this to you. So um, this is not two 
in, in a patient who's wide awake, okay, um, this is not something that is particularly useful unless they cannot give you a reliable exam. Like they're like totally inebriated, intoxicated. They can't give you an exam, right? Uh, because you, remember, they, have to, they actually have to give effort to whether or not there is rectal tone or not, right? But if they can't do that effort um, or, they're, or they're not in the right state of mind to do that, right? Um, then you don't have an accurate exam. So, uh, so what is the bulbo cavernous reflex? So this is generally done on patients who are intubated and sedated, all right? And it tells us whether or not they, um, so a patient may have a poor exam either due to spinal cord injury or they may be in spinal shock, okay? And if they are in spinal shock, okay, um, you will know whether or not the bulbo cavernous, you will be able to distinguish their poor exam based on, on this reflex, okay? So what that is is, uh, if the patient has a Foley catheter in, you have to, if you're, when you're doing the digital rectal exam, you have to tug on a catheter and that will stimulate a, uh, basically the pelvic splank neck nerves. They will, they, they basically go, it, it's a, it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's one of these reflex arcs that uh, is, is a spinal reflex. It just goes right through the spine, right? So uh, this, um, this will, if there is a sphincter, anal sphincter contraction, Right? then that means that the, the uh, bulbar cavernosis reflex is intact and the patient is not in spinal shock. If there's no reflex, the patient may be in spinal shock. Okay, And what that means is, is that you don't really have a truly accurate exam. Um, if when the reflex returns, that patient is no longer in spinal shock, and then whatever their exam is now right, is, is pretty much their real exam. So that means they're out of that spinal shock period when that reflex returns, okay? So that's kind of the key there. Um, so if you feel no reflex, and in a couple of days, let's say the patient is um, no movement, and in a couple of days later, you feel a reflex, and there's still no movement, that means that that is really their exam, okay? But until that movement comes back, um, then, you, uh, then you can't really, um, you can't really have an accurate exam. Okay, so summarize again. Ejected from the windshield, polytrauma, GCS 50 on arrival, distal lower extremities, weakness is two out of five. Um, all right, in terms of the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, let's just say he's stabilized, right? He's doing okay. Um, what do we want to do for imaging? Um, would you just get the cervical, lumbar, and thoracic, just, and the head probably as well? Pan, pan, basically full body CT, chest, abdomen, everything. They get the whole, the whole, get the whole gamut of uh, imaging. What, what this literally means, they, you have like 10 people pushing this patient to CT, they run them through the scanner and then they, the radiologist on call will, will look, get a read and tell you quickly what they see, okay? Sometimes things get missed. Because remember, this is a very high trauma, very, you know, so many things moving around, but like big, big, awful things will, and actionable things are generally caught in this, pan um, during this time, okay? So in terms of, so we went through all the different things you wanna see during the clinical evaluation, right? We're now at almost at the um, imaging stage of this. So we're gonna go in that one second, but here, what is this? So this is, have you, have you all heard of the Asia scale? Are you familiar with that scale? Uh, like somewhat. Okay, so GCS is more for head trauma, right? is a standardized way of describing a patient's exam in the setting of head trauma. Asia, okay, is a uh, American Spinal Cord Injury Assessment. That's what it stands for, A-S-I-A, -S American Spinal Cord Injury Assessment, right? So uh, the Asia scale is what we use for spinal pathology of any kind, trauma, cancer, okay? These are the big things, tumor in particular, we use Asia. Now, this was designed as a research tool primarily, okay? But we do use it clinically as well too. And I'll explain to you, there's some good things and bad things about this, but this is, this is the way we kind of standardize the way we describe our patients for research because trauma is very heterogeneous in terms of the clinical presentation, right? No, no two traumas are the same. So, but we do try to, because we want to do research on many patients, we have tried to standardize it in a way, and this is what we have developed, okay? So this is, this is literally the age scale. This is like you would have this piece of paper and you, you go through this, but we don't really do that. Okay. It's just not clinically useful. So what it is, you have motor and sensory. Okay. It's broken up in the sides of the body, right and left. Okay. So you have to do this on both sides of the body. So you can see, see look here. So every, every um, 
dermatome is, or, or nerve root is expressed, but only the clinically relevant ones are the ones that we talk about, right? So it's basically C5 through T1 and L2 to S1, okay? I mean, yeah, even thoracic ones as well too, but, but that's more of the sensory stuff, right? Like T5, there's no like really, you know, what intercostals are innervated by that. So it's not really clinically useful, but it, it is, uh, it could be sensory useful, right? So you have, you have the motor scale, you have the sensory scale, which is broken up to light touch pinprick. Okay, again, right side, left side of the body. And basically what you do is you start from, you start from head, work your way down, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, you basically put the points from zero to five on each one of these things. So the last normal um, level is where you will say for motor. So you would say, uh, say if, if the last five out of, so elbow flexors are five out of five, five out of five, five out of five. Okay, so he's all five out of fives here. He was five out of five hip flexors, knee extensors, and then the ankle dorsiflexors, long toe extensors, and ankle plant effects were two out of five, right? So he would be an L3, right? L3, and then we'll talk about it. So that, that would be the motor level, be L3, because the last normal level were the knee extensors, so that's L3, right? Okay, so that'd be, that would be that. So that, that's that. That's how that works. Now, for the sensory, you do the same thing. You you would have light touch and pin prick. But I mean, good luck doing that in the trauma setting. So many things are you're not you're not going to take a pin and you know go through all these things. It's very difficult to do. Okay, um, and there are a lot of other uh, modifiers at the bottom there. See this like complete incomplete Asian impairment scale. Um, you know neurological levels. There, there are a lot of things that go on here. So here it is. So here's your thing. So Asia. So it goes from A to E. A is nothing, no sensory, no motor. E is normal, neurologically intact, okay? B, C, and D are something in between. Now, B is sensory, no motor. C is non-useful motor. D is useful motor, but not intact. E is intact, okay? That's the way I think about that. So what does that mean? So you basically have this split up into three different things. You have someone who's complete spinal cord injury, Asia A, you have someone who's neurologically intact, Asia E, or you have someone who's incomplete spinal cord injury, which is B, C, and D, okay? It's those patients, the incomplete patients, who are the most, like they are the most uh, emergent of the emergent kind of cases. These are patients where you have the greatest chance of improving their outcomes by emergence surgery if they ended up, if they have something on imaging that needs surgical intervention. These are your patients that will do the best if you're able to decompress spinal cord, okay? There was a big math, there was a, a, a landmark paper published by Dr. Phalanx in the early 2000s showing that um, early uh, reduction of, so a patient who came in, got a CAT scan, so he had a, a cervical spinal cord uh, uh, fracture and spinal, and spinal cord compression. The sooner you can get pressure off the spinal cord, decompress spinal cord, even when it comes with uh, traction, um, the better those patients will do. Okay, so um, anyway, so that being said, so that being said, basically, uh, uh, that's the way you think about it, okay? I always used to get confused by Asia C and Asia D, but basically the way to think about that is Asia C is non-useful motor function, right? I mean, they're moving, but it's not really useful, meaning they can, it's like a two or a one or a two or a three maybe, they're, or not even a three, I think it's, it's, it's more one and two. It just, they can move it, but it's not really anything that they can be functionally independent, right? Three and four is they can move it up off the bed. There is some strength there, but it's not neurologically intact, right? So that's actually useful motor function. That's where D comes into play. That's very rare. The most common clinical presentations are Asia A, Asia E, and Asia C, okay? The A, C, and E are like 99% of the patients you're gonna see. Very rarely do you see B. Very, very even more rarely do you see D, okay? It's really A, C, and E are the most common presentations of this. So this guy was what? He was an L3 Asia C, right? It was two out of five, okay? Um, and uh, if you throw in some of these, they have some modifiers here for like specific types of spinal cord injury syndromes, like spinal sec ward, anterior cord, so on and so forth. Okay, so determine sensory level. Um, as I described, this is done for the right side and the left side, right? Uh, I, I won't get into this too much, right? The motor examination is, <clears throat> um, uh, done on a six point scale, zero to five, right? The motor exam is one is basically the tiniest little flicker of movement. Two is movement, but not anti-gravity. Three is anti-gravity, but cannot resist. 
Um, four is able to generate some resistance, right? You could just do a little bit, but that's it. Five is normal strength. Okay, so three, um, three, the way three is, you, you're gonna see this clinically, is the patient really struggles, but they're able to get it up eventually. So that's, that's three, okay? Um, notice that they don't put any modifiers like four plus, four minus. It's not useful here in this trauma center. You're just four, okay? Um, and then you do this for every single level, right? Five, six, seven, eight, uh, T1, this is for upper extremities, and then lower extremities, L2 to S1, okay? Okay, so let's go back to the case. We get this CAT scan. What do you guys see? See, so there's five, four, three, two. Well, it's like a L, L5, four, three, two. It's like a L1 burst fracture into the canal, retropulsion into the canal. Oh, very nice. Very good. Okay, excellent. So, um, excellent. Very good. So, this is this. So, just start from the beginning. So, this is sagittal CT, right? That I have over here. All right, you have sagittal cut and you have axial cut through the plane of L1. I, I told you what it is right here. Okay. So, you, excellent. You, 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 you basically got it, right? So, five, four. So, you, you count for, I like to count from the bottom, you count from the top, but you don't know where, where, you don't know where this is, right? But I know where this is, right? This is sacrum, right? So, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So, you want to look at a couple of things. You want to look at the overall alignment, right? So alignment from, I guess, from five, four, three, two. So, so if you ignore everything above L2, it all looks pretty good, right? You see the posterior aspects of the vertebral body is all aligned. You see the anterior aspects of the vertebral body is all aligned, right? Um, and you see the spinous processes, the space in between them um, are basically all the same, right? There's not like anything that seems uh, too significant, right? But if you look here at L1, what do we see? We see a vertebral body compression fracture, right? Meaning the, the body's compressed. It affects both end plates, right? The top and the bottom end plate, okay? And you do have some retropulsion of the fragments into the canal. See that here? Here you go, all right? So you have, what, we, what we typically, the way we talk about this, there are many different uh, classification systems, but the way we talk about this is degree, what percentage of compression and what percentage of occupation of the canal. So we're trying to describe this to the attending at, say, two o'clock in the morning, um, and he doesn't see the images, right? We say this is an L1, complete burst, complete meaning it affects top and bottom end plates. If it's just one end plate, it's a partial burst fracture, right? So it's a complete burst fracture, retropulsion of fragments in the canal. I say it's about 50%, about I'd say maybe a little bit more than that. So 50% compression of the vertebral body. The way you would do that it is you just measure the uh, superior, the length of this and then compare it to the length of a normal one. And that's, that. you know, you just divide and there you go. So uh, roughly 50%, right? With about 50, maybe a little bit more than 50% of uh, space occupied of the fragment in the canal, maybe a little fracture of the pedicle on the right side too. You see that? See the pedicle's fractured here? Okay. So um, sometimes MRIs are useful, sometimes they're not. And the acute trauma setting, because remember, it takes time, resources, da 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 da, da back and forth. If the patient has acutely, you remember, you have to move the patient from that stretcher to the MRI table, they have to get the scan. These are all things. People can get, that, that whole process, they can get injured during that time, right? So uh, I've seen that happen. So on the MRI, what do you guys see? It's interesting, right? Because on the CAT scan, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, you would look at this and be like, oh yeah, yeah some of these patients can be just like this and they're neurologically intact, believe it or not. They can have even worse and they're neurologically intact. But here, look at this. What do you see here? So like the core compression. Yeah, specifically what area of the spinal cord? Uh, let's see. Uh, you mean, I guess the, the core itself, I guess the uh, cor the right, uh, the conus medullaris? You got it. That's it. So good. Conus medullaris, right? And what do you see? What do you see inside? And then uh, tell me what, what sequence is this? Yeah, what, so this what is sagittal T2. Good. Um, yeah, very good. Sagittal T2. And then the, on the right side is the axial T2, right? Through the right. plane of L1, same thing. So you see is, is you're looking at the same thing, right? You see retropulsion of fragments. You see pressure compression of the conus medullaris. And then what do you see inside the conus medullaris itself? Oh, I guess you can see some like white uh, hyper intensity fluid maybe suggests like edema or something, something along yeah, those lines. Exactly. So you have a contusion, basically a contusion, most likely a contusion, right? Um, <clears throat> and then you can see that here on the axial, you see that little, um, that little kind of vertical white stripe in the spinal cord right there, right? See, these are the kidneys out here, right? This is the vertebral body, right? This is the psoas muscle here, right? These are the great vessels, right? This is, this is you know, the IVC and the aorta, right? Vertebral body. 
And then these are some of the fragments of the bone that are out here and that's pressure on the conus medullaris. He does have a little bit of CSF signal behind, but what's concerning is this stripe, okay? That may explain what on his exam? May explain his, his whole exam, right? But, but in particular, the rectal, right? That whole, that whole area, that this may explain that, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, good. So anyway, summarized, 32 year old man, high speed MBA, UCS 15. He has an L1 complete burst, retropulsional fragments, posterior tension band disruption. Oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't show you, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, how would you assess the posterior tension band? What, what sequence on the MRI? I, I apologize, I should have included that. I did not include that on this. So this is a T2, What's, what, what do you wanna see? Um, which sequence do you wanna assess ligaments? Use like the flare one, right? Yeah, or well, or stir. Um, what that is, what is stir? Um, so I think essentially just gets rid of the normal fluid that's supposed to be there. So all the fluid you see, is, it's kind of like flare of the brain, right? Yes, it's a fat suppressed, right? It eliminates the, the fat, right? Because fluid is hyper intense, fat is hyper intense, okay? If you have edema in the ligaments, it's fluid. So that's gonna look bright, just like the fat's gonna look bright. So how are you gonna tell the difference? So what that does is it eliminates that fat suppressed image, it gets that signal out, and then all you'll see is true edema and the true fluid in the ligament. So you'll see that all light up. So he just, you don't see it here, but take my word for it, it was all lit up, all hyper intense here. So he had posterior tension band disruption, he had compression of the conus medullaris, possible, irreparable injury, we don't know, right? It, if it's compressed, if there's extrinsic compression, it may be reversible, right? You, you take that pressure off, as Dr. Failing showed, and they, these patients often can do well. So you don't know what their true exam is. That's why there's this concept of getting this patient decompressed as soon as possible, okay? He's an L3 Asia C, as we discussed. So what do we want, what do, we want to do next? So let's have a quick question. So, yeah. so I think you mentioned in the beginning that if they don't have the uh, bulbar cavernous reflex, you can't really like assess their true neurologic latch. So can you say they're Asia C or can you, you know, or? Okay, excellent question. So in his case, he's awake, alert, and able to follow commands, right? Um, <clears throat> so most likely, most likely he, that exam is real, okay? If the patient's intubated with not in a reliable exam, you have no idea what's going on. So that is a hint, not necessarily 100%, but it gives you a hint as to what you're seeing, if it's truly what they, where they are at, okay? One thing I forgot to mention is that that Asia scale that I talked about, the paper that I showed you, that little thing, those check marks, that's technically supposed to be done at three days after injury, okay? Not at the time of the injury, okay? Even though we report Asia scores at the time of the injury, that's not correct. It should be done at three days after the injury. Why? That's usually the time it takes for the patient to come out of spinal shock. And they're very, and those patients often their exams just on their own with very minimal intervention, those patients get better, okay? So there's this concept of patients who come in as let's say Asia A, if you don't, and then a couple of days later, once they kind of wake up and you know they kind of settle down from the injury, they actually improve to like an Asia C sometimes, right? That's movement. They went from nothing to actually some movement, right? So some people say, so it's, it's hard to know what, but the thing is that the surgical intervention is often at the time of the surgery, it's not three days later, right? So it's hard to know what is their true exam. So the Asia scale is actually meant to be assessed at three days after injury, okay? But we often don't have that, that luxury of time. We have to intervene on them much sooner. So there's not, it's, there's a lot of things to this that haven't really been figured out well yet, but for your, sake. The high level point takeaway here is be wary when you're looking at spinal cord injury papers that purport that a certain intervention helps, right? When given at the time of the surgery or given at the time of the injury, look at when the Asia scale was assessed. If it's assessed at the time of the injury, you may, you may have that little warning flag because technically it should be done at three days after, but that we don't usually do that. Usually like 24 to 48 hours, usually what we do, not three days, but, <clears throat> but you should always be kind of thinking about that in the back of your mind that maybe, remember these patients, some subset of these patients just get better spontaneously. So if, is that, if that difference is true or if it's just from time itself, okay? Just remember that. All right, so anyway, um, okay, what to do next? So 
I'm, I promise I'm getting almost done here because I feel like I'm running out of time and this is going a little bit long, but I hope you guys are learning something here. So, okay. So you can see how this is very multifaceted and multifactorial. It's not easy. <laughs> you have to really think, but if you think about this stuff systematically, it, it helps. All right, so now we're on to TLEX. So what's TLEX? So TLEX is another grading system. We've already been through what, three, four grading systems already, right? GCS, Asia, now TLEX, right? Uh, we didn't even talk about the morphology ones, like AO spine, right? To talk about the morphology of fractures, right? So anyway, so TLEX is um, another scale that kind of dictates surgical decision-making here. It's broken up into three things. Again, morphology of the fracture, the integrity of the PLC, or uh, morphology, uh, your exam, neurology, and then the PLC. Morphology, neurology, PLC, okay? So morphology is the type of injury, okay? So you see compression, burst, and you see that there are more points given for the distraction type fractures. Why? Because the, the, the integrity and stability of the thoracolumbar spine are predicated on the integrity of your PLC, your posterior ligamentous complex, okay? If this is injured, right, as you can see here, it gives you the most points, is three, okay? And then neurologic status, so if you have a distraction type injury, is four. By definition, you have injury of the PLC. So minimum, you have seven points, right? Without even knowing the neurologic status, seven points. Look at the bottom here, predicts need for surgery. You're, you're already surgical, regardless of that patient's exam, right? So, so that's the key, all right? So anyway, the neurologic status, you can see, um, can tip you over the edge, but you really see a lot of the points here are given just based on the um, imaging, right? The first two are radiographic, the third one is, is exam. So intact actually gives you no points, right? Does, does that make sense? If a patient is neurologically intact, does, you may not have to take a patient for surgery, right? Does, you have to think about whether that's, they need it. However, they may have distraction, you know, four points for distraction, three points for injured PLC, but intact, right? So even though they're intact, they, by, def, by TLIX criteria, they probably need surgery, okay? I wanna say one more thing here. Just because someone is surgical by TLIX, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean they need surgery. This is, this is the surgeon's knowledge, decision-making. This is predicated on a surgeon to make that ultimate decision of whether or not the patient needs surgery. This is just to guide your decision making, okay? Just because someone has, can have, it, can have a, it could be a million, but they don't necessarily need surgery, okay? Remember, these are just things that are meant to help you in this setting to make evidence-based decisions, okay? But they're not perfect. I wanna kind of drill that home too. They're not perfect. They're, they're evidence-based, yes, they're good, but they're not perfect. All right, so neurological status is, you can just see here, okay? The interesting thing to me I always saw was the incomplete injuries give you more points, intact gives you less points, right? That's, that, that's interesting, but it makes sense if you think about it because it has to do with timing of the surgery. Those incomplete injuries, you wanna take them as soon as possible generally. All right, so what is, okay, so what is our OR plan here? Let's go back. So what do you, I, I don't expect any of you guys to really know what to do here, but, but tell me, what, what would you wanna do? It, just generally. So what are, what are our things? We, we decompress reduce, instrument, and stabilize, right? Okay, so what, those are like basically, you can say that for any patient, right? What are the goals of surgery? Decompress the spine, reduce the fracture, instrument the spine, and stabilize, right? But it's usually, it's usually uh, decompress, instrument, reduce, stabilize in that order. Okay, so what, what, what should we do here? Anyone wanna just take a guess? Um, so you could do a, uh, I guess a laminectomy at, you know, like L1. Yep. So that would be the first decompression, right? And then reduce, um, I guess you have to do it from the front if you want to reduce this, right? I guess a, let me imagine. So that's a big surgery. You want to, so you're, you're gonna go, um, so you want to go uh, from the anterior and posterior for this patient. So, okay. So remember, if you're gonna go anterior, now you're talking about a laparotomy, right? You're, you're talking about a big scar, right? It's L1, it's very high up, right? You have the great vessels in your way. You have the aorta and the IVC right in the front, right? Look at that MRI. And you may not even need um, anterior column, you're, you're saying anterior column reconstruction, right? You may not even need that here, right? So um, what we have found is by instrument, so what, what I did is here. So very similar to what you did, but I did a purely posterior instrumentation and stabilization. Okay, so why? So you can actually reduce, so you can you decompress the conus medullaris and you can reduce those fragments back into the fracture, okay, with certain tools that we have, okay? 
Um, what we typically do is we place screws, pedicle screws above and below the fracture. If you're lucky, you can get a screw into the fracture. Now remember on that CT, the left pedicle here is intact, right? The right is, is disrupted. So we, we typically, what we do is we place a short screw um, into the pedicle here, a tiny one. Usually the length of these screws is about 45 to 50, let's say 45 to 60 millimeters. This one is about like a 30 or 35. So it just, just gets into the vertebral body um, at the index level. Um, and then we go above and below the fracture. So here we go. Okay. So here, so this is what the post-op image looks like. Okay. You can see that we place, this is L1. We place one screw on the left in the intact fracture. We place screws two above, two below. There are some biomechanical studies showing there that, and then what you, the goal is here to kind of preserve his overall alignment. Okay. Um, some of the nuances here are, um, straight rod at the thoracolumbar junction. You want that to be straight, right? That there's not too much lordosis there. Um, you want, uh, you want, because really the key is not so much instrumentation as what his overall, um, alignment will be. Sometimes they get a little kyphotic, um, from the fracture, but that's okay. There are a lot of studies showing that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really um, mean anything to long-term outcomes. Um, and, uh, we did a laminectomy at L1, as you can see here. Okay. Um, I did a little bit more than just L1. I just really want to decompress that conus medullaris. Uh, now somebody mentioned something about instrumenting and taking out the instrumentation later on, I, I did do that here. What does that mean? Okay. Instrumentation is literally placing in screws and rods. Fusion is if you've done spine cases, decorticating the bone, laying down bone graft, okay? If you're fusing the patient, that means that that instrumentation is gonna live with them essentially for the rest of their lives, right? You're, you're really trying to fuse that bone. If you're instrumenting them or internal bracing is what I did for this patient. My, goal is to let that fracture heal. And then at about a year, we're going to go back and take that instrumentation out. Okay. That was the goal of this surgery. He's young. Um, he's a very active guy. And, um, and this is more, this is more pertinent to younger patients, like, you know, the adolescent ages, but for this patient, um, I, I want just to just purely do internal. I, I generally like internal bracing for these patients. Um, there are, again, some studies showing that uh, patients who have intact Burst fractures, they tend to do better with, um, with non-surgical management. Um, uh, and, but there are a lot of caveats to that. That's not, this guy was not intact, obviously. But, um, but my protocol for these patients, the young patients in particular, um, is to instrument and take out the instrumentation about one year. Uh, right around that time, the, the instrumentation will pseudo, and then we just take it out. Okay? So he's not quite at the one-year mark yet, but it'll, probably, it'll be almost there, actually in December. He came in December, so... Uh, he'll be at one year mark in December. So our goal is to take that instrumentation out then. Um, okay, very good. Any questions? I'm, uh, I know you guys, you guys have been fantastic so far and I don't want to take up all your time. So uh, one quick question. So let's say, what if the patient doesn't follow up for like whatever reason, then, you know. Yeah. That's another thing. Um, it allows it because they have this hardware that by definition will not last. This, it, there was no fusion here. It's purely instrumentation, right? Remember, all hardware will eventually fail unless a solid fusion is formed. All hardware will fail, fail okay? So um, this keeps them in the system because eventually these screws will fail and have to, have to come out. So um, it keeps him following up with me. That's another reason why I like that, okay? If I'm convinced that this patient I will never see again, as soon as they're out of the hospital, they're gone, then I tend to lean towards fusion. All right, okay. Thank you. Oh, so uh, also a quick question about you, you, what you just mentioned about all hard words may fail. So does it mean that with these, there's no any chance of any os osteointegration? Uh, for there, that, would you your mind? There, absolutely, there can be, okay? But in this technique, this was, this was done uh, percutaneously, okay, uh, with, with uh, fluoroscopy. So we're not, the, the goal is to maintain the integrity of the facet joint capsules, right? And purely instrument the pedicles. You can even see on, can you guys see my, my uh, mouse pointer? This yes. is, yeah, yeah. is a, this is a, this is a eight month post-op x-ray, right? You can see there's no fusion of the facet joints here, right? There's no fusion. So you can actually see this, this gap here. That's what I want. I don't want this to fuse. I, all I want is this fracture to heal. Okay. And I like his alignment. He, he's looking good. So <clears throat> can there be osteous integration? Yes. Okay. 
So, but, uh, and if there is, then you just leave it alone. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it at that point. Cause then you're, you're essentially like, you're almost disrupting some natural processes taking place. And, and if they're doing fine, fine. Right. But, um, but here I do not expect there to be osseous integration because just from the virtue of the procedure itself, we're going percutaneously. Right. Um, and there's no, there's no, essentially there's no, um, uh, uh, no, there's no fusion. It's just instrumentation. So, um, so while yes, it can happen. It's, it's my goal is for that not to happen. I don't want that to happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, now how did I do laminectomy? Right. So yes, I did. I did poke, uh, percutaneously. Right. And then we do a small midline incision and we just did that laminectomy. Okay. So that, that's how that, that's how that took place. Just so you guys are aware. Now my, the way I, the way I do this, um, there are many different ways of doing this, but, um, the way I do this is we do a, we do the mid, we do a midline incision. And then what you can do is you just undermine it, um, super fascially. You, you put in big, um, big, uh, retractors, and then, then you can just do it percutaneously through the fascia and then you close. So you just have one midline incision rather than all these little stab incisions, which I, I, I personally, I don't like that. So, um, uh, so yeah, and besides we have to take out the hardware anyway, it's, you're going to make a big midline incision. So, uh, so that, that's the way I do it. I do one midline incision, go through the fascia, put the rod in and then go through the fascia to the area to do laminectomy and then close. Yeah. So I just have a quick question. So in this patient that got the MRI, um, could you, I know do people debate, you know, whether you need the MRI or not, because, you know, there's time sensitivity and like resource and, you know, the neurological deficits. So what are your thoughts on? Yeah. So, uh, okay. Good, good question. All right. So, um, I want in this case, right. So when you have an, we have an incomplete spinal cord injury in a patient who, um, who comes in, you want to get MRI, right? Cause how do you know, how do you know where to decompress here? Yeah, ideally just L1, right? But it could be more than that. You don't know, right? And, and, and we did like a we did like a thoracal and lumbar MRI, by the way. Um, uh, <clears throat> he had he had like a little compression fracture in the thoracic spine. I didn't show that to you. It, it ended up being insignificant. But um, but uh, you don't know the degree of injury, right? Um, how do you know? In, in this case, look, it actually told you that there was a spinal cord contusion here. What if there's epidural hematoma? They're all Many, diff many different things. They don't know what's contributing to that exam. Okay. Incomplete spinal cord injuries. You want to get an MRI complete spinal cord injuries. You want to get an MRI. If he's intact, if this guy was intact, right. Mm, yeah. What's MRI going to show you really, right. It, 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 your, your decision-making is, is a little bit of a different area on the, on that, on that scale. The MRI here actually helped us, right. It told us where to do the decompression, how far up and how far down there was no epidural hematoma here to evacuate. Um, and, um, and it also told us if the degree of pre-existing injury that he had, right. Um, so he has actually recovered quite well after this injury. He, he, he took a long time. He did, he had no, um, he had straight calf for quite some time after the surgery. Um, but it spontaneously came back, believe it or not about one, uh, right around, uh, six, seven months after the surgery. So these patients do very well, actually he's ambul he's fully ambulatory now, completely full strength in his lowers. He's essentially neurologically intact with the exception of his um, urinary function. It's not hundred percent back to normal, but he is able to void spontaneously now, um, without a straight cast. So that's good. I think that's a great outcome for him. So my plan for him is in a couple months, he's going to come back for removal of his instrumentation. We'll get a CAT scan to see whether or not there was osseous integration, as you mentioned. And then, um, and then if there's not, and I don't expect there to be, we'll, we'll take it out. Thank you. That was great. Very thorough. Many different ways of doing this too, by the way. Some people, um, I did not think of corpectomy and was merited here, but you, some people can do that. If you do, you do not have to instrument as high up as I did. You could, you could just do one up, one down, okay? But if you're gonna go short constructs, you have to get anterior column reconstruction. That's the key, okay? If you're not gonna do anterior column reconstruction, you gotta go long. And because I was able to get a screw in at the index level, I didn't have, sometimes people can go three up, three down, four up, four down depending on the bone quality, a lot of other factors, but here, um, uh, I decided to just go two up, two down. Okay. And maybe I could have done just one up, one down with a screw at the index level, who knows, but you never, no one will ever fault you for being, um, conservative and going more than is ultimately necessary. Cause if this hardware breaks and fails and a patient does poorly and needs some big surgery, you know what I mean? Hindsight's always 20, 20. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Very good. 
Um, any other questions? Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.